Okay, so uh, before I actually get started, let me just say I love talking about games, and I love talking about games with people like you. So uh, if you see me wandering around alone, uh, please come up and talk to me, okay? I want to meet, well, I don't want to meet all of you, but I want to meet a lot of you. Um, okay, so uh, what I want to do today is a little bit different. Uh, usually my talks have a kind of a narrative arc where, you know, you started making a uh, establishing a thesis and then you talk about the, uh, the thesis itself and you end with conclusions and a, a call to action. Uh, today I'm going to do something a little different. This is, you're my beta testers, okay? I've never given this talk before. I've never given a talk like this before. Uh, so uh, if it's not very good, one of the things you can talk to me about in the hall is how I can make it better, okay? Uh, so with that out of the way, I want to talk about uh, uh, as you can see, thoughts I live by, I'm going to stand over here because I'm blocking this. Um, what I do at my studios is I make a very specific kind of game. I make immersive simulations. Uh, and they're a bit different than a lot of people's games. Uh, and what I have to do is I have to find a way to communicate that to my teams and my funding partners and my publishing partners. Uh, and I don't want to lecture. I mean, I love lecturing. but. Uh, I don't really want to do that with my team and funding partners and publishers. So what I do is I create uh, posters. They're, they're not inspirational posters. Inspirational posters are terrible. Uh, they're posters that are designed to communicate uh, what we do, how it's different, why we do it, and then, of course, uh, to some extent, how we do it. Um, I have a lot of these posters, and usually what I do is I select, you know, 10 or 12 of them. Uh, and uh, post them all around my office. Uh, my, my teams probably think it's kind of obnoxious, but um, I, I usually take 10 or 12. Today I'm going to go through all of them uh, in 45 minutes, and uh, I hope to leave some time for Q&A. So uh, with that, um, I just want to start a little, with a little bit of who I am uh, and how I got here. Uh, September was my 40th anniversary making games, so I've been making games longer than almost all of you have been alive. Um, I, have, I have seen a lot, and I don't know how I've survived other than incredible enthusiasm and working with, with people like you. Uh, I started in tabletop games. Uh, working on uh, a variety of things at Steve Jackson Games and TSR, working on uh, the folks who do AD&D. Uh, I've worked at a variety of companies uh, in uh, video games. I've worked on dozens of, of tabletop games uh, and uh, a bunch of, a bunch of uh, video games, obviously. Uh, I've done Choose Your Own Adventure books. Uh, I've, I've written a novel. I wrote comic books for a while. Thankfully, all of these are out of print. Uh, so you, you can't read them. Uh, I've done startups. Uh, I've worked for huge companies. Uh, I've taught. I created the curriculum and hired the staff and mentored uh, uh, several young developers who have gone on to do great things, I'm happy to say. Uh, and now I, I'm working at a, an indie publisher, well, an indie developer called Other Side. Um, we make what we call player-powered games. That's the immersive simulation stuff that I'll talk about uh, here in a little while. Um, we were recently acquired by a company called Aonic, uh, and so far uh, it's been a great partnership. So uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, Aonic is going to do great things, and I hope we do great things with them. Um, we're working on two games. Um, Argos Riders on the Storm is an original concept that I created. Uh, we are currently just about ready to go into pre-production. Um, we published that picture of, of the whale, the strange whale, uh, a while back, and people started guessing what it was about and what the game was like. They all got it wrong. It was awesome. Um, this, is, this is one of the, the most um, audacious concepts I've come up with, and so uh, we're, we're either going to rule the world or... Well, not. Um, the other project is Thick as Thieves, uh, a multiplayer thief game. It is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, and I'm, I, Argos is kind of my baby. And Thick as Thieves, as chief creative officer for the company, I'm helping them out as well. Uh, okay, so that's, that's me. 
Uh, let's start with the posters. Uh, they fall into a variety of categories. The first one is things related to development. Um, this one is hugely important to me. Um, you know, I come from a, a generation where we would love working all night, sleeping under our desks, uh, eating too much Chinese food, driving home at three in the morning and not remembering how we got there. Um, you know, that's, that's the way I always worked, but that's not the world we live in anymore, and it's not the world we should live in anymore. So uh, I tell my teams, these are the three things that, that lead to a happy life. Um, health and family um, can go in either order, okay? I don't care if you value family over health. That doesn't make sense to me, but okay. Um, but work always comes third, right? You have to put your personal life ahead of work. Um, we're a I told you this was going to be weird. I'm going to rip through this stuff. Um, <laughs> One of the, we're not a, a, a solved problem. Movies and books and, uh, and other linear media are solved problems. Uh, the position of sprocket holes on film didn't change for 100 years. Um, and, but we don't know what we're doing. We're still an infant medium. We're still making it up as we go along. Uh, and so for me, for my teams, uh, every project has to have one new thing, one thing that no one in the world has ever seen or done before. Um, even if you're working on a licensed game, uh, a, a tiny little indie game, you can do something that's new and different. So for my teams, that's a requirement. Um, another thing that's interesting about games is we're the first medium in human history, the first one ever, that instead of telling people something like movies and novels do, um, we can ask players questions. Uh, I'll come back to this too. Um, in a movie, you can watch the film, you can see what the director was doing. The director basically tells you, here's what I think about the topic I'm making this movie about. Um, and your job as an audience is to interpret it and say, I agree, or I disagree. That's all you get to do. In games, we do something different. We can ask you to think about a topic, and then through play, answer for yourself what you think about the topic. I will come back to that as well. The key thing about that questioning is we don't answer the question. We don't answer the question. The player, the, not the character, uh, the player actually decides how they feel about something. The, I mean, the, the person on the other side of the screen, you know, with fingers on the keyboard or a controller, they're the ones who answer. Uh, no one will ever know what I think about the end games in Deus Ex, for example, uh, because what I think doesn't matter. It's what the player thinks that matters. Um, in addition to questions that we allow players to answer, before I start a project, I create what I call the commandments. Uh, they're rules, uh, they're a creative box, constraints within which uh, the team works. Uh, here are some of the commandments from Deus Ex. Let me read them all. No, I won't do that. Um, I, I actually have these at the end of the presentation, if, and I'll come back to it if people want to look at this. But I do this myself alone in a room, you know, as I'm coming up with a concept. Uh, once I have that in place, this is, this is a, a really powerful thing, and I really recommend that you do this yourselves. Um, I set what I call the priority and quality bars, okay? And it's about knowing where to settle. The words, this is good enough, just drive me crazy, okay? So what I do is I say, priority number one is the one new thing. We are not going to compromise on that. We are not going to cut it. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how hard you have to work to make it happen. That we are going to do, all right? The second thing is the area uh, where we want to beat the state of the art. Players have expectations. Other games, our comps uh, do certain things. Uh, in a shooter, it might be you know, uh, combat, of course. Um, we want to do better than that. Okay, um, so we want to beat the state of the art. We really don't want to cut or scope there. But if we have to, okay, we can do it. Then there are areas where just match the state of the art. You know, we don't have to do better. Uh, in Deus Ex, we didn't have to match the state of the art in shooters. We didn't have to match the state of the art in, uh, uh, in the thievery and stealth. Uh, we didn't have to match the state of the art in... Um, in role-playing elements. We just had to be good enough that players, when they figured out 
I can do anything I want, would accept that we didn't quite come up to the level of the, uh, the dedicated genre games, uh, which is where we get to the wouldn't it be nice category number four. And what we do is, like I said, it's about priorities. It's about scoping, how we scope. It's about knowing where it's okay to settle. So you cut from the bottom, right? Um, that's, that's the power of this, and it really is pretty, pretty cool, I think. Uh, there are teams that believe it's, it's enough to do as much as you have to. Um, yeah, that's good enough. Okay, we're done. I hate that. Uh, that's not good enough. So we always want to strive to do as much as we can, not as little as we have to. And it, it sounds obvious, but I've seen many teams ignore the obvious, and it's really damaging. Your chance of success, if you're just doing as much as you can, uh, I, I, sorry, as much as you, you have to, uh, your chances of success are very small. Okay, this one, I don't expect any of you to pay attention to this. Uh, I don't, I've been saying this for years, no one ever listens to me, um, but I can't tell you how much I hate the concept of MVP, minimum viable product. I, it, it drives me crazy. Um, minimum shows contempt for players, that they're going to accept, they'll settle for something. Uh, viable says it isn't as good as it could or should be, okay. Um, product says we make widgets. Okay, what I would prefer is MPG. You're not gonna do this, I don't even know why I say it. Um, MPG stands for maximum possible game. Okay, maximum because we're going to give players as much as we can, not as much as we have to. Possible because we strive for the highest level of quality. Uh, and game, because we don't make widgets, we make games. Everybody in this room makes games. So go out there, spread the gospel of MPG, and, and let's, let's make maximum possible games. And now I will move on because you won't do it. Um, okay, this is another thing I use a, as motivation uh, for myself and my teams. Um, people hate it when I say this too. Have an enemy. Have something to push up against. Uh, Cliff Blazinski just today said he wanted to crush John Romero back in the 90s. I mean, that's a great goal. I mean, not, no, hold on, let me explain that. I, I love John Romero. He, he has made a huge difference in my life, and he loves games and knows more about them than anybody I've ever met. Okay, so I love John. He is not someone I want to destroy. Um, but what I do, my wife will tell you, when I'm playing a game, I spend more time yelling at the screen, why did they do that? Uh, and I have actually occasionally thrown my controller across the room out of well, frustration. So that, when I see something that frustrates me, that drives what I do, the games I make. Uh, I, was, I love Thief, I worked on Thief. Don't get me wrong, Thief is a great game. But Deus Ex exists in part because the Thief team would not let me fight my way past a guard. And I said, I'm gonna show them that you can make a game that lets you fight, sneak, or talk. Uh, so frustration can be a great motivator. Uh, if you're a team lead, be the stupidest person in the room. Make sure you are the stupidest person in the room. Hire people better than you, listen to them, let them make you better, okay? Make the game better. Uh, and if you're, if you're on a, a team, make sure that your lead knows you're going to tell them that they're stupid, okay? Uh, I tell my teams, I mean, this is literally true. I tell my teams that it's their job to tell me I'm full of shit at least once a week. Be, because I am, and because I'm wrong a lot of the time, and they will make me better. Okay, well, I already said that. Uh, okay, so that's, that's some development stuff. Imagine all of these or some of these up on the wall of the studio as reminders of who we are, what we do, and why we do it. So let's, let's talk about some design-oriented things. Um, for me, it's important that developers get off the stage. Uh, if you're showing off how clever and creative you are, you're not doing the job that games can do, okay? We can let players experiment, try things, solve problems for themselves, uh, and be the stars of the game. It's not for us, don't show off, okay? It's not about you. Uh, immerse players in the game world. 
I make games that are, we call immersive simulations. It's a terrible name, uh, but it's the best we've come up with. If you have a better one, let me know. Um, and the, the idea, or one of the ideas behind that kind of game is to remove barriers to belief that players are in the game world. Uh, that means UI elements cluttering up a screen, uh, cutscenes, um, metagame elements, you know, where you go to a separate screen to upgrade your character and stuff. I'm not saying you have to eliminate those, but anywhere you can eliminate those, don't be a slave to convention. Uh, come up with some way in the game world, be, you know, pay attention to diegetics, build things into your game world wherever you can, and don't just remind players, you're just playing a game, don't worry about it. Uh, a lot of people think I'm crazy when I say this. Wandering around a world and you know, dealing with fog of war is exploration, it's fun. Uh, I always say this, aimless wandering is the enemy of fun. Uh, where to go and what to do are not fun to me. What to do and how to do it, that's where the fun, the I tell you what. I, I, always, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, all of my games have two characteristics. One is completely linear narrative, something that no one has ever noticed, which is weird. Completely linear narrative. Uh, and you always know what to do. I always tell you, here is your job right now. But the key is um, not, to, not to tell players how. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, because another game does something is not a reason to do it, okay? Convention is there to be broken most of the time, most of the time. It's almost never the right answer. If you're dealing with your new thing or beating the state of the art, obviously you don't wanna borrow other people's stuff. Um, but if you're just trying to match the state of the art, yeah, go for it. Um, because Game X does it that way is a fine way to approach it. Uh, because it's a game is never the right answer. Um, saying, well, it's just a game, players will buy it. It, it shows contempt for your audience, uh, and you should never do that. Uh, it, it says that players will lower their standards um, and just accept it because it's a game. Uh, I, I will not allow that in my studios. Uh, give players a why. Um, a lot of games, in fact, I would argue most games, um, what they say is you're doing this because I tell you to, because there's nothing else to do, or because you want to up the level of your character. Uh, I think we have uh, better ways to do that. Give players a reason to care beyond optimizing a character or solving a puzzle. And I will come back to that as well. Give them meaningful goals. You can do that with, I could talk all day about this, but you can do it through narrative. Uh, there are a variety of tools you have for creating meaningful goals. You should do that. Um, this is another controversial one. On uh, Epic Mickey and Deus Ex, I wouldn't allow anything in the game where the designer didn't show me the real world reference. Uh, we met, built things in Deus Ex based on blueprints and photographs. In Epic Mickey, every single thing in the game, the, the team had to show me a photograph of the attraction that they were recreating. Um, but that's too far. I mean, the game I'm working on now, I can't say too much about it, which kills me because I really want to talk about it. Um, but uh, I, I had to rethink that. It is inappropriate for us. Uh, it, it's a fantastic world. It's not, I can't talk about this. Um, anyway, it is inappropriate to build from blueprints and, and re I'm gonna move on before I say something. Um, <laughs> In my studios, you're not allowed to say the word puzzle. I, I, I will slap you down if you say the word puzzle. Um, we create problems and challenges. And what that means is a puzzle, to me, at least as, as I interpret it and as I present it to my teams, uh, a puzzle is something that has a single solution. A designer comes up with something, the player has to do that something. The joy of that is undeniable. You know, I'm smarter than the designer is something that players love, okay? It is not what I do for a living. Uh, we create problems and challenges that uh, are open to solution in a variety of ways, that players get to solve problems the way they want. Uh, there are a variety of tools. I'm happy to talk about this out in the halls, about how you do this. Uh, I will be here all day if I don't keep moving. Um, the one way to think about this is, it's not about players must do this, it's about players can do this. We give them tools. 
We give them uh, agency, okay? We let them try things, but we never say you have to do this. If someone says the player has to or players must in, the, in my office, all I hear is blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's the end of that discussion. Uh, I, already, I already talked about this, so tell players what, not how. Uh, there's always another way. That's one of our hallmarks. If fighting is too hard for you, try sneaking. If sneaking is too hard for you, try talking. If talking is too hard for you, you need to figure out how to live your life. I don't know. Um, but uh, there, there's always another way is one of the rules of the road for us. Um, simple way to think about this, and I, I tell my teams this all the time. Uh, I want both of those things, but I can only have one. Yeah, which one is really important to me? That's, that's what it's all about, okay? It's not about, I got the sword of doom. It's about the sword of doom or the wand of killing. Which one do I want? Okay, that's the stupidest example I could have come up with, but it was off the top of my head. Um, this is an interesting one. Never judge players. Um, you know, there are plenty of games, I call them play the meter games, where, ooh, you're good, or you're evil, or you're light, or you're dark, or, you know, I, I hate that stuff. Um, they're judging the player. They're saying, this is good, this is bad. Players will judge themselves. If you give them opportunities to act the way they want, they will judge themselves, okay? And then they will argue with each other. Arguments among players are great. You know, it's not about, wasn't it cool when you killed that boss this way? That, that has no interest for me at all. It's, wasn't it cool when you killed that boss and someone else says, what boss? Okay, uh, that's, that's exciting, okay? I could go on about this. I'll talk about this out in the hall too. Um, the, the most amazing thing about the, the games that I work on and many games that you, go, you folks have worked on is that players surprise themselves. They try things that they think will work because the worlds are all logical um, and it works uh, or it doesn't and they understand why. A year after we shipped ASX, I watched a tester play uh, a scenario. He was in a place where there were three problems. I knew what those three problems were. I knew some of the solutions to those three problems, but I watched this guy set up a variety of things, move a barrel here, create a hiding point there, get out the weakest weapon in the game, take one shot, and solve all three problems with one shot. No one on the planet had ever done that before, I guarantee it. And that surprised, I mean, he was happy because he solved a problem in a really cool, creative way. I was happy, I fell on the floor because no one on the planet had ever done that before. Uh, okay, I'm getting through it. Um, so here's, here's where we end up. Uh, no one believes me when I tell them this. I've been doing this for 40 years. Believe me, if you believe nothing else, um, Life is short and your career is short, assuming that you survive burnout. Uh, the, the average programmer lasts five to seven years in the game business and then they very sensibly get out. Um, it, it goes by and uh, you, you don't want your career to be judged on the basis of, uh, you know, you, you made some money for some, okay, the, the people don't believe me. I, I can't believe I keep getting work. Um, <laughs> You know, mediocrity is not an option, okay? It's, making games is too hard for that. This is always your goal, okay? G people think winning awards doesn't matter and it, you know, until you start winning them, okay? And then all of a sudden they become much more important. But again, mediocrity or making money usually for someone else um, is, is not a, 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 it's not the best goal. It's not a great success criterion. Uh, making great things or striving to make great things uh, is what it's about. Um, here again, uh, a lot of people are motivated by selling 100 million copies of a guy not going to get work after this. Damn it. But uh, uh, make, selling 100 million copies of a game, great, go for it. Making a gazillion dollars, great, go for it. I have other things I'm trying to do, okay? And other things that I, I want other developers to see in my work. 
Uh, we are an art form. I used to be embarrassed to say that. I am no longer embarrassed to say that. We are, you are making art, not just commerce. You need to make enough money that someone funds your next game. I get it, okay? But we make art, so strive to do that. Uh, I like multiple end games. So here is yet another end game. Uh, these, when I was uh, at Junction Point, I, I, I wrote it, well, actually before that, I wrote a manifesto. It was 12 pages long. Um, it was much more coherent than this talk has been. Um, and no one would read it. Y you folks don't read. It drives me crazy, okay? 12 pages, forget it. Um, so I wrote an eight-page version and then a four-page version and a two-page. I'm not kidding. Uh, and finally, I, I whittled it down to two words. And these words are plastered all over my studios when we actually had studios. Letters foot tall, okay, all around the studio. Play style matters. How you decide to play it makes a difference in the experience you have, okay. Uh, and the goal there is to allow players to create unique experiences. I say the words unique experience all the time to the point where my teams probably hate it. Um, but every player creating their own personal narrative through play is the only thing I'm interested in. I've been trying to recreate the feeling of playing Dungeons and Dragons since 1989, okay? Um, creating unique experiences and personal narratives is what we do that, again, no other medium in the history of humankind has been able to do. I mean, think about that. No other medium ever. How could we not want to do that? Um, and this is a, another way to say it. Um, we can turn every player into a storyteller. We have been storytelling animals since we came out of the trees. And uh, we are the medium. I mean, like, I've written a really bad novel. Great, okay? Most people can't write even a really bad novel. Uh, I've written really bad comic books. Most people can't do that. Uh, I've made really bad movies that no one will ever see. And, but still, not many people can make even a bad movie. But everybody can play a game. And by the way, we are now at a point where anybody who says they don't play games is lying. They're the outliers now, not us, okay? But anyway, we are storytelling animals, uh, and we turn every player into a storyteller, creating unique experiences. Um, here's, here's another way to think about this. If two players describe the same experience of an encounter, a mission, or an entire game, we have failed, right? I mean, there's, the way most games are described uh, is a character gets, a character, forget about player, a character gets to the edge of a chasm and leaps across it and barely catches on with their fingernails and looks up and there's a Tyrannosaurus Rex looking down and they get out their gun and they shoot the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And another player's option is to say, yeah, that was cool because they had exactly the same experience. Oh my God, I'm not gonna curse. I said I wasn't gonna curse. Um, I hate that. What I want is, wasn't it cool when you leaped across that chasm, blah, 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 and another player says, what chasm? Okay, that's the, that's the beauty of games. We can allow players to create their own experiences. Uh, okay, this is the last one, I promise. Uh, okay, here is an argument we can have. Uh, I, am, I am weakening on this because fun is a word that is, it is hard not to say fun when talking about games and, and game design. Um, but I defy any person in this room to define it, okay? Uh, if you can't define it, it is not useful, okay? I'm a very literal-minded person. If you can't define it, you can't, you shouldn't use it, okay? So, Help me define fun. Change my mind. I dare you. Um, the other thing is, name another medium, anywhere, any medium, that is defined by a single characteristic. They don't exist. We are the only one that is defined by fun. Now, there are a couple of folks trying to do things that might be more serious or not described as fun, but they're few and far between. Like I, I can't even, well, maybe I could name like two, but... We, are, we shouldn't be a medium that is defined by a single word. That, that sucks. So 
happy to talk about this. Uh, you're going to have to convince me. Um, okay. For me, uh, giving players the joy of creativity, of experimenting, of trying things, of creating their own experiences, that is joy to me. Um, your joy may be different. Creating a puzzle that stumps players. Uh, creating a challenge that requires skill to overcome. There are many kinds of joy, okay? I'm not saying mine is the only way, but uh, find your joy. I mean, for me, it's brainstorming with a team on the development side. For you, it may be, I mean, if you're crazy, it might be a spreadsheet. You know, I have no idea. Um, but there are many joys of game making and, and game playing. Uh, so be sure to define yours. And that's because this is so important. Um, you have to know what success looks like to you or you can't, you can't achieve it. If you can't say, here is success and here's what it looks like and maybe even here's how you can measure it, you are not going to succeed. I am comfortable saying that categorically. Know what success looks like. Um, I have a much longer talk about, believe it or not, about success criteria. Uh, but what I've done here or tried to do is give you some of the, um, the high level uh, ways in which success is measured for me. Uh, okay, so this is, this is my challenge to you. Figure out what your success criteria look like, okay? Figure out what, what brings you joy and what joy you want to bring to players. Okay, the other thing is success isn't guaranteed even if you know how to define it. So for me, uh, aspiration trumps success. Trying to do these things, getting as close as you can to the things that are important to you, uh, that's what's critical. So, I mean, we, I, I, this is not directly relevant here, but we have changed the world. I, I mean, in 40 years, we used to, we used to talk, we're going to change the world. And, and we have. The people in this room have changed the world, okay? And we're not done. I mean, we need to aspire to bigger and better things, or at least different things. Um, your definition of success uh, may be the way to go. You may fail, but uh, you need to be irrationally obsessed with trying, okay? Um, you're going to get pushback. Oh, my God, do people argue with me about all that craziness I just talked about? Uh, especially the one about making art and then a little bit of money. That one I get a lot of trouble for. Um, but you need to fight. You need to be willing to fight for what's important. You need to be willing to say no and not compromise. Uh, know where it's okay to compromise, more to the point. Uh, you have no idea working on Deus Ex how many times people just told me, make a shooter. Just make a shooter. You know, on Epic Mickey, just make a platformer. Uh, and you have to be strong enough to say no it's why, but you need to be irrationally obsessed with accomplishing your goals. And then this is my, my message to you. Um, I, I've told my wife that should I ever have a tombstone, this is what I wanted to say, okay? It is better to fail gloriously at something hard and wonderful than it is to succeed at something mediocre, okay? Uh, I am willing to walk away from this and never make a game again if I can't do what I want to do. Uh, I'll open a bookstore and lose money that way. You know, it, fail gloriously. I, this may be the best advice I ever give you or the worst advice. I don't know which. Um, but it's, it's stood, stand, yeah, stood me in good stead over the years. Um, okay, let me reiterate, this has been all about me. I am not saying you should adopt all of my philosophy and success criteria, though I hope you will. Um, it's, it's up to you. Know, what, know how you define success. Go for it. Aspire to it. Uh, and that is it with four minutes and 35 seconds to go. Um, that is my email address. Uh, you are welcome to email me. Uh, I do not promise a quick response. Uh, oh my God, I do not promise I will respond to all of you. Um, but especially if you, if you have good answers. I mean, there's a round table about mentorship and I'm really into that. Uh, so uh, some of you, you know, you never know. Uh, we might establish an ongoing dialogue. Um, and I do have, uh, that's my, my personal blog that nobody ever goes to. Uh, I've also started blogging at developer.com. 
uh, go to developer.com. It's way better over there um, where I pontificate about all sorts of stuff. Uh, and this is up here if you want to look at it. This, is, this was Deus Ex. It's just one example of uh, the commandments, the things that I said uh, to the team. You're going to do this. Uh, this is non-negotiable. Okay. Uh, we have three and a half minutes for questions. Thank you so much. Um, this was an amazing talk. Round of applause. All right, now so, try and stump me. Let's go. <laughs> we have roughly 15 minutes for questions. So, okay, I already see a raised hand here. Hello. So, first of all, thank you so much for your uh, such important uh, meaning point about humanity and family goals. So, thank you. It's really important for us. And I want to ask you, so we are developing a visual novel, and it's um, what you talk about uh, storytelling and art, it's all about us, you know. And uh, my question is, you know, how to hold this balance between art and commercial? Because sometimes it's really difficult. Oh, it's very difficult balancing art and commerce, there's no question. Um, and again, you have to decide, you may value commerce more, You, I mean, you have to keep your studio going, and that may require compromises. Um, for me, the, I guess the place I start is I try to find things that people are already interested in and not try to convince them to be interested in something new, okay? Um, and in that way, you can draw people in while still making art. Deus Ex was all about, I mean, I started thinking about that because Conspiracies were everywhere. People were scared about AI. You know, people were scared about viruses. Wait a minute, I, it's now. Um, you know, terrorism was, a, was starting to be a big deal. I found things, this was in 1997. I found things that people were already interested in and then wrapped my, my gameplay around that. So I was able to attract an audience uh, as well as, uh, as give them all the things that I just talked about. Uh, Epic Mickey was kind of the same thing. I mean, uh, I, I love Disney. I love Mickey Mouse. I, I mean, I like Uncle Scrooge better, but that's another story. Um, but one of the critical reasons I, uh, I, I wanted to make a Mickey Mouse game was because I thought with Mickey Mouse as my star, the most recognizable icon on planet Earth, I could sneak my art in to a mainstream audience and make a bunch of money for Disney. Not for me, but for Disney. And it worked. I mean, Epic Mickey was by far the best selling game I've ever worked on. And yet, though none of you gave me any credit for it, it was, it was an immersive sim. The same philosophy that is expressed there. I used a bunch of those slides making Epic Mickey. So there, you, you have to find things people are already interested in, sneak your art in, um, and, and don't worry too much. When I'm not wearing a mic, grab me and I'll tell you the real answer. So thank you so much. Sure. Boy, it's hot up here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, obviously, this is a big honor. Uh, <laughs> as someone who's also uh, in video games because of Dungeons and & Dragons and someone who started his career in game design from Dungeons & Dragons, uh, I sort of wanted to ask um, a question uh, about a way to import, you know how in Dungeons & Dragons, you, you had this part in your talk about problems and challenges. How do you import uh, this interactive, uh, creative uh, pathway to solutions that Tabletop is so very good at uh, providing to players into the video game medium? Holy cow, how much time do I have? Um, okay, there are a lot of answers to that. This is another one, grab me in the hall. Um, okay, first of all, uh, you have to leave scripted uh, activity behind. Scripting is, is like bad. You need to build systems, build systemically, okay? You need to build 
wind that blows grass, that gets set on fire, that blows the embers. To, you, need, you need water that flows and douses fire and puts out and wets paper uh, and attracts the attention of a guard. I mean, you need to, you need to build, um, build things that have a variety of uses that are logical but not entirely predictable. Uh, that's that's one answer. Um, that's probably the best answer I can give you off the top of my head. But um, what? Oh God, this is a huge question. Uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing you can do uh, is if you make a game like Deus Ex or Epic Mickey or Thief or System Shock, uh, the, the games are always listening. I mean, we know what everything that a player does, every single thing they do. And what we can do is we can detect that uh, they're shooting stuff. And then we can say, shooting makes noise. And noise attracts guards, okay? So there's, there are secondary and tertiary effects built into what we do. So uh, let me give you a specific example. That was terrible. Um, a player sees a, a wooden door they need to get through. Um, there's a, a guy, um, the men in black in Deus Ex explode when you, when you kill them. There's an explosive barrel next to that guard. Um, you take a shot at the barrel, it explodes. The, the wooden door is, is scri not scripted, it is systemically designed that wood, when it takes kinetic energy, shatters, okay? Uh, the thing blows up. The guard explodes, the door is thrown off its hinges, but it makes noise, okay, which attracts a guard. And what does that do? It gives the player who just shot the barrel, killed the guard, exploded the door, it gives them more opportunities to, to shoot stuff, okay? Now, differently, a player might say, okay, I see uh, another way, that's a red door, and I see a red door up there, and I bet, this is a terrible example, but I bet I, that if I go through that red door, I can bypass that guard and that explosive barrel and that wooden door. Um, I'm going to sneak up there and not make any noise and get past it without attracting the attention of a guard. So each of them, just because of the way the, the level is laid out and the fact that, you know, for example, the door is designed not an explosion shuts a, kills a door. It's set up so wood, when it takes kinetic energy, c takes damage. If that had been a metal door, it would have been, uh, s the system would have said, metal doors are impervious to kinetic energy, not that metal door is impervious to exploding barrels, okay? So building systems, it's not physics exactly, but building systems that interact with one another in logical but unpredictable ways uh, is the answer, and there's a much deeper answer than that, but that's the best I can do. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Yeah, grab me in the hall, okay? <laughs> grab me in the hall. Uh, one, oh. Yeah, thanks. Morning, uh, thank you for an inspirational talk. Actually, I've got two questions, but you might want to choose and answer one. Okay. So a lot of things you were talking about right now were about control, how we control the players, how we control the game, what can or can be done. And in the end of the day, do you think that the players should adapt to the game or the game should adapt to the players with all the systems built inside? So that's with the first one. And the other option, and I hate to ask it, but still, um, with AI going on, with all the systems, there is a chance that in a couple of years we will have a, like AI-based game masters of our own that will be good enough. So do you see this as a freedom option for the game, to give more freedom to the players using this kind of technology? Okay, uh, I'll try and answer both briefly. Um, I've, I've been arguing uh, and trying to conceive of a, a virtual dungeon master for decades. And we've never been ready for that. There's never been the, the capability to do that. And it is possible that we will get there. Um, I'm personally no longer interested in it. Um, you know, I, I like the personal touch. You know, uh, my teams and I make games. We don't let some 
you know, software do it. Uh, I think there are other uses for AI that are, are pretty interesting, but I don't think you're going to see me using it very much, if at all. Uh, in terms of player, player control, what you, what, games for me are a dialogue between player and, and designer and developer, okay? And so I would say there needs to be a balance. Uh, what, what I do, what my teams do, is give players goals and give them tools, okay? Uh, tools they can use to interact with a, a deeply simulated environment, okay? Uh, to achieve the results that they want. It gets back to the, my last answer. Um, players decided what kind of experience they were going to have, uh, not, not me. I told them, you need to get into that room over there. I don't care how you do it. I mean, it, it drives me crazy that many games, I, I would argue most games, they care how you get into a room. Like, there's a blue, the, the really overly simpli simplistic answer, but uh, example, but there's a blue door, it's locked, you need the blue key to get through the blue door. You kill the blue monster who has the blue key, and you get through the blue door. Uh, I look at that and I go, why do I care how you get through that door? Blow it off its hinges. Um, pick the lock. Uh, talk to the, the guard outside and convince them to let you in. Uh, sneak through an air vent to get into the room. What I care about, what's important is what's in the, the room on the other side of the door, you know? And so that's not me controlling the experience. That's the game and the, and the player talking to each other to figure out how, they're gonna, how the player is going to accomplish the goal, if you see what I mean. So it's, it's a dialogue. It's neither, neither one is right or wrong. Neither one is, is more powerful. Each of us has a, a role to play. And, you know, if I play mine and they play their, theirs, we have a game. If I don't play mine, there's no game. If they don't play theirs, there's no game. So I would say it's, it's equal, not, not one or the other. Thank you so much. And again, feel free to grab Warren's.